This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by TheGreatCourses.com, where you can watch or listen to thousands of lectures from top professors and experts. Get up to 80% off select classes by visiting TheGreatCourses.com slash galaxy. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 176 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is William Shun. His short fiction has appeared in Salon, Storyteller, Asimov's, and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, as well as various anthologies and best of collections. His chapbook, An Alternate History of the 21st Century, appeared in 2007, and his novella Cast a Cold Eye, written with Daryl Murphy, came out in 2009. His new memoir, The Accidental Terrorist, describes how, as a young Mormon missionary in Canada, Bill found himself charged with hijacking. I also just want to add that Bill is an old friend of mine. We belonged to the same writer's group in the early 2000s, and his story is one of the most amazing true stories I've ever heard. I've been waiting for years for him to finally publish this book so that we could get him on the show, so I really hope everyone sticks around for that. And today's show is brought to you by The Great Courses. Watch or listen to thousands of lectures on over 500 subjects. Each course is taught by top professors and leading experts from the most respected institutions in the world. It's everything you love about college without those pesky student loans. One course I'd like to mention is called Thinking About Cybersecurity, From Cybercrime to Cyber Warfare. If you listen to our interview with Mark Goodman in episode 142, you were probably alarmed to hear how easily hackers can watch you through your laptop camera or crash your car into a wall. You may have thought to yourself, wow, I really need to know more about this. Well, now here's your chance. Thinking about cybersecurity is taught by Paul Rosenweig, who lectures on cybersecurity at the George Washington University Law School, and who formerly served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy in the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The 18 lectures cover every aspect of cybersecurity, from Stuxnet to botnets to hacktivists, and the video of the lectures features great production values and plenty of high-quality graphics and visual aids. Then, once you're up to speed on cybersecurity, check out some of the other classes from The Great Courses, on subjects ranging from science to art to history, all available on CD, DVD, or as digital downloads. And The Great Courses is giving our listeners a special limited-time offer. Eight of their courses, including Thinking About Cybersecurity, are available now at up to 80% off their regular price. To take advantage of this special offer, go to thegreatcourses.com galaxy. So that's thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. Don't forget, go to thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. All right, and so now here's our interview with William Shun. All right, so we're here with William Shun. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Okay, so first off, just tell us a bit about how you got into reading fantasy and science fiction. I first discovered science fiction, I believe it was the sixth grade, from the Weekly Reader magazine. The monthly issue would come around, and they had a an edited version of an Isaac Asimov story called Reason. And just the the way the story was constructed, the logic of it, uh, really struck me when I was in sixth grade. And I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I already knew I wanted to be a writer, but all of a sudden the world of science fiction opened up to me, and that was it for me. Well, that's the story where the robots get religion. Yes, it is. Strangely enough. So it seems right up your alley. True. Uh, because uh, you were raised Mormon. And um, I don't know, tell us a bit about that. Like, uh, I don't know, how, how did you feel about Mormonism growing up? I had a complicated relationship with Mormonism while I was growing up. I absolutely believed it was true. Uh, but I also was sort of resentful of the fact that I believed it was true. Uh, and I had some really deep questions about it from a young age. Thinking back, it seems pretty remarkable, but at about the age of five, when I started kindergarten, I was suddenly introduced to the idea that there were religions other than my family's. Uh, we lived in Los Angeles, and my parents sent me to a Lutheran elementary school, and that was really the first time I'd been introduced to another religion, and I kept having arguments with the teacher in class. And 
when I'd go home at night, I'd lie in bed thinking about what would have happened if I'd been born into a Lutheran family, and it kind of blew my mind. And I started wondering, how did I get to be so lucky as to be born into the only church that had the truth? And I started to be kind of afraid of what might have happened if I hadn't been born into my family. Right. Now, so in your book, you go through a lot of reasons to doubt that the Mormon religion is true, right? How, to what extent were you aware of those kinds of facts when you were growing up? I was aware of a few of them growing up, mainly the ones that arose out of the Book of Mormon, because Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon and claimed it was a translation from ancient records kept on gold plates that he'd found buried in a hill. And it mentioned animals like elephants and horses and strange creatures also called curalums and cumums that lived on the American continent because that was where the action of the Book of Mormon took place. And I knew from reading a lot of paleontology and other sorts of scientific books while I was growing up that there weren't horses in North America at that time. And that all of the elephants or elephant-like creatures, like mammoths, mastodons, had died out long before the Book of Mormon was supposed to have happened. So I would construct in my mind these elaborate rationalizations for how there could possibly have been elephants in the Book of Mormon. Maybe Joseph Smith just used the closest word he could think of for a creature that we didn't really know about, like a taper or something like that. It wasn't until I got to be quite a bit older, uh, probably while I was a missionary at age 19 or 20, that I started encountering some of the uh, more strenuous objections to, um, to the life of Joseph Smith and the way his history had been presented to me growing up. Yeah, yeah. Well, so tell us about your, the right. How did you get into the writing? When did that start? The writing started for me in first grade. I was in a combined first, second, and third grade class in a public school in Los Angeles. And it was October, Halloween was coming up, the teacher had us all write scary short stories. There was going to be a short story contest, the winner would win a peachy folder and a pencil eraser. And I really wanted the peachy folder. <laughs> So I wrote a story called Rattlesnakes and Cobras. Actually, it was really called Rattlesnacks because I didn't put the silent E on the end. <laughs> um, and the teacher's reading all the stories to the students in class. Everyone's written these nice little stories about happy ghosts and maybe scary witches, but they're fun. And then she reads my story, and one girl started to cry. <laughs> and, I and that's that when you knew cool. you had to be a writer. Exactly, exactly. That was the coolest feeling. <laughs> and so so were, were your teachers generally supportive of you writing that kind of weird stuff? Generally, they were, yes. Uh, I did have a couple of teachers in high school ask me, why are you bothering with this science fiction stuff? You, you're talented. You could do much more serious kinds of writing. And I really just brushed them off. I thought that science fiction was serious, and I still do. So I didn't, I tried not to let that affect me or my writing. Yeah. And how about in the, in the Mormon community? How did, how did people feel about uh, science fiction writing? Well, that's very interesting. A lot of people in the Mormon community really thought that science fiction writing was something you shouldn't do. My dad was one of those people. He thought that science fiction was evil somehow. I had brought home once a, a copy of an Andre Norton novel, and I forget which novel it was, but it had to do with a character who might have been a clone. And my dad read the back of this book and said, clones are evil, son. Cloning is taking the power of God into your own hands, so you can never read science fiction again. Actually, I did keep reading science fiction. I just snuck it into the house and was more careful about hiding it. <laughs> but at the same time, when I was in high school, I ran across uh, in the school library a book of short stories, a really early book of short stories by Orson Scott Card. And I read on the back cover flap that he had spent two years of his life in Brazil, and he lived in Utah. 
And I put two and two together, and it, I figured out he must have been a Mormon missionary, so he must be Mormon. And that was a really huge inspiration to me, uh, to see that there was another Mormon who could get away with writing science fiction. And of course, in the years since then, the number of Mormon science fiction writers has just exploded. Right. And I mean, I understand that Mormonism is actually a fairly science fictional religion, as far as religions go. It really is. I consider Joseph Smith to be the the er science fiction writer of Mormonism. Uh, he essentially invented a whole fantasy world in the Book of Mormon. At least that's how I look at it. And in fact, he was a fan fiction writer, too, because the Book of Mormon is nothing if not Bible fan fiction. And then he took that book and built out, if you look at the Book of Mormon as like his Lord of the Rings, um, the rest of his theology is kind of like the Silmarillion. He went back and filled in all the, the history and cosmology of the universe in some really stunning ways. He taught that God lived on a planet that orbited a star called Kolob, where every day was like a thousand of our days, and that we were all intelligences in the world before this one, and that somehow uh, he turned us into spirits and then sent us down to Earth to get bodies and be challenged. And one day after death, we would be able to become gods like him and actually create our own world. So there's this whole infinite, uh, just a gi gigantic family tree of gods stretching forward and backward into infinity. Uh, and he taught also that God was once a man like like any other man on earth. I mean, do, do you have any sense, Bill, for how that compared to ideas around the same time, both in, in fiction and other religions? Were, were other people talking about life on other planets at that time? Or was, was that kind of, kind of, out of out of left field for Joseph Smith to have come up with? I'm not absolutely sure about that. I think that that was one of his ideas that came straight out of left field right out of his own imagination. There were a lot of other things that he taught that were sort of, uh, that were in the zeitgeist at the time, you know, like uh, polygamy, um, communal living, things like that. He certainly would have been exposed to from other uh, strange religions of the time. But I think later on in his career, he was pretty much off on his own track, uh, coming up with his own wild ideas that that really made a lot of his followers uh, sort of scratch their heads. There were people who would leave the church over um, new changes of doctrine that Joseph Smith would introduce, and this happened pretty much every year. <laughs> uh, I and mean, you talk in the book about how he he incorporated elements of his own uh, autobiography into his theology. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I sort of look at the Book of Mormon is Joseph Smith's first novel, and he commits kind of the same same sins that any writer does when they're writing their first novel. He seems to be the main protagonist through the first little bit of the book. There's a character named Nephi, who is the fourth son of a prophet named Lehi, uh, and Joseph Smith was the fourth son of his father. And there's just all kinds of, of interesting parallels uh, between Joseph's life and the Book of Mormon. And I really think that he's the Mary Sue in hmm. in, <laughs> in that book, at least uh, uh, through Nephi's part of the book. Hmm. Okay, so, so you, were this, you were a science fiction fan, you were writing stories, and I know you, go to, you went to the Clarion Writers Workshop. Uh, tell us about that. I did. That was a really formative, important experience for me. I went to the Clarion in 1985 when I was 17. I had graduated from high school at 16 and started at the University of Utah. I'd had a year there, uh, but it was expected not only in my religion, but really in my family that when I turned 19, I would become a missionary for the church. And I'd been saving money for my mission ever since I was uh, a freshman in high school. I'd been working summers and I had a good little amount of savings. And that's because the church requires that you support yourself when you go out into the mission field, or your family does. 
Uh, but I had this money lying around, and I'd been reading in Asimov Science Fiction some essays by Algis Budras and Lucius Shepard talking about Clarion, and I kept seeing in Asimov's, in other magazines, that a lot of people who were selling stories for the first time had gone to this workshop, and I really wanted to go. So I asked my dad if I could apply, uh, and he was resistant at first, but finally he said, okay, I could apply. I said, I have the money. And he said, that's for your mission. I said, well, you know, let's let's apply and see what happens. And I got in, which I think surprised my father. And then he was kind of stuck letting me go. And I was the youngest one in my clarion class. Not by, not by very much. There were a couple other kids there who were 19. Most everyone else was in their 20s. And the thing that really struck me there, besides the fact that I kind of found a new tribe all of a sudden, uh, didn't matter that we were all different ages. We all had this love of science fiction and fantasy and writing particularly in common. And we all got along really well. And nobody really, they didn't make mean fun of me for being a Mormon, which I expected that they would. Um, but they were actually all very protective of, of me. They made sure no one, if we went out anywhere, no one was going to offer me a beer. They were going to send me home in the same condition that <laughs> they found me. So that, uh, uh, my father would not have any reason to ground me and never let me come to a science fiction convention or workshop again. <laughs> I mean, did, did you talk about Mormonism at all with them while you were there? I talked a little bit about it with them while I was there, uh, mostly to answer questions that people had for me. Um, I remember talking to my friend Bob Howe, uh, who I'm still friends with now, 30 years later, uh, he would ask me really challenging philosophical questions uh, about, you know, things like uh, homosexuality and other other things that Mormons would consider a sin, but that he didn't. And he was asking me to defend the church's position, and I, I had kind of a hard time doing it. The strange thing I learned at Clarion, besides everything I learned about writing, was that... The people I thought uh, or that I had been taught in church were were amoral um, and who didn't have a very good uh, set of philosophies. Turned out they did have really strong philosophies and were had just as much morality, uh, if not more so, than I did. And certainly they thought about it more. And I found that really striking. Okay, so you mentioned you went to Clarion and then you had to... At some point in the near future after that, you had to leave on this mission. Uh, tell us about leaving on that mission. Uh, well, I had one more year of college I could fit in before my mission, and then it was time for me to turn in my application papers. Now, when you go to serve a mission for the Mormon Church, you don't know where you're going to be sent. They have you write down what some of your preferences are and whether you speak any foreign languages and so forth. And I had studied French and German for four years uh, between the two of them in high school. And I figured I was definitely going to get sent to a foreign language mission. And I was really excited because that's basically the only reason I wanted to go on a mission, because I could learn a foreign language and spend two years in another country. And then I got back my mission assignment in the mail which supposedly came directly from the Mormon prophet in Salt Lake City. It had his signature at the bottom, and it said, you are going to serve in Calgary, Canada. <laughs> and I was completely devastated. <laughs> I didn't even get to, get to serve in the French-speaking part of Canada. I was going to Western Canada, which was kind of pretty much like where I lived, except, except farther north. So, uh... uh I reported to the Mission Training Center in Provo, Utah for three weeks. Uh, we go through an intensive boot camp there where you spend all day, every day in class, just learning this, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, memorizing scriptures, and especially practicing uh, teaching the six missionary discussions, which are the lessons that you need to teach somebody before they can be baptized into the Mormon church. Uh, so we basically taught these lessons to each other and role-played all day long, um, went to gym class, went to sleep, got up, did it again. And then after three weeks, we're off to the airport and off into the mission field where we get dumped with our first uh, companions. 
and thereafter have to start knocking on doors for 12 hours every day. Right. And I mean, I, I knew this story because I've known you for years, but there was so much in this book that I, I wasn't aware of, including the thing about you, that you were engaged at the time. Uh... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting story. I hadn't really had, had a very steady girlfriend uh, ever while I was in high school. And then, of course, I met the girl of my dreams three weeks before it was time for me to go on my mission. I had actually had a crush on this girl in high school. Uh, in the book, I call her Katrina. Um, she was on the drill team. Uh, she was really pretty, really popular. And she was a science fiction fan. So you're like, oh, my God, I can't even. She was. I, I have to hold on to this woman because, <laughs> you know, drill team plus science fiction. It's amazing. She told me Frank Herbert was her favorite writer, and my heart just about exploded. <laughs> uh, but this was all kept, being kept secret, though, from your parents? Yes. They knew that we were dating, and they didn't really approve because I was so close to leaving on a mission. And when you're on a mission, you're not supposed to date. You're not supposed to uh, even use the telephone, really. You're not supposed to call home. You're only uh, allowed to write letters home once a week. So it's a very it's a very controlled environment. You can't even watch television or movies. You can't read books except for the scriptures. Uh, so uh, the fact that I was going to have this that I was leaving with a girlfriend was a, was something of a concern to my parents, and uh, I certainly didn't tell them about the engagement. The engagement happened uh, just before I got on the plane to fly to Canada. Katrina was there at the airport. We kind of snuck away to make out a little bit before I left for the last time. And I ended up making a ring for her out of the tinfoil from a stick of gum. And that's how we got engaged. Hmm. Well, but you say there are all these things that the missionaries aren't supposed to be doing, but it sounds like those rules were not particularly well observed by pretty much anyone you came into contact with. A few people followed the rules strictly, a few other missionaries that I knew. But uh, for the most part, these rules were so impossible to keep strictly that all the missionaries would come to some kind of accommodation with the White Bible, which is what we called our little rule book. Uh, we would pick and choose which rules we were going to break and which ones we were going to keep. And a lot of people, a lot of people read books or comic books. Um, in fact, as soon as I got out into my first uh, proselytizing area, which was Brooks, Alberta, uh, my trainer, my first companion, took me straight to the library to get a library card. And I was, I was stunned and thrilled. And so we just, during all our downtime, we were reading, reading, reading. I was reading science fiction. He was reading Louis L'Amour's. And we had, a, we had a great time, at least as far as reading went. Right. And to give people a sense of how unhinged this is, this this line jumped out at me. Uh, you say, skiing was one of the biggest no-nos in the White Bible, almost as bad as swimming or riding in a boat. Satan was said to hold dominion over the waters, which made swimming pools and the open sea perilous places to be. Yeah. Um, and I don't even know really where that doctrine comes from. Um, but it's, it's just one of those nebulous doctrines that's floating around out there in, uh, in the Mormon consciousness that Satan has dominion over the waters. Uh, I wish I'd, I knew the provenance of that, but that meant that you had to get permission before you went on a boat or, or did anything of those sorts while you were a missionary, because it was the church's feeling that, you know, if you're out on a boat, you're just asking for Satan to, uh, to try to destroy you somehow. And really, that's something that was pounded into our heads all the time. We're missionaries, we're representatives of Jesus Christ, and we're fighting for righteousness. So the devil is going to marshal all of his forces of darkness to oppose us. And so we, we were kept paranoid about the fact that the devil was after us at all times. Uh, but so, so, so things really start to go south uh, at one point where you decide you, you've had enough of this and you want to go home. So tell us about that. Yeah. Um, well, my first trainer, um, my first companion, went home after I'd been in the mission field for about three months. Uh, he was at the end of his mission. And they brought in a, a new guy to my area to be my senior companion who just did not want to do any work at all. And, you know, I was okay uh, slacking to some extent. 
Um, I didn't mind if we stopped knocking on doors early and went and shot some pool or something like that. But this guy, uh, I call him Elder Deadman in the book. Uh, Deadman did not want to do any work at all. And that made me kind of depressed and, and kind of paranoid. Like, we would go to the bowling alley all afternoon. We'd come out of it smelling like cigarette smoke. <laughs> and I was, I just knew we were going to run into somebody who would smell us and we'd be in trouble right then and there. So all of this, coupled with the fact that I was so homesick and missing my girlfriend so much, and uh, uh, I just got more and more depressed as the month of December wore on. And at Christmas time, I talked to my girlfriend on the phone. I really wasn't supposed to call her. You're only allowed to call your family uh, on Christmas and Mother's Day and no one else. Those are the only times you're supposed to be able to call home. But I called my girlfriend and talked to her, and she told me that she missed me. And the way I heard that was, come home now. <laughs> and so I started making plans immediately to buy a bus ticket and and go home to Salt Lake City. Um, I went to bed with my clothes on. I was ready to sneak out in the middle of the night and go to the bus station. Uh, and as I was sneaking away from the apartment with my with my luggage, uh, my companion, Elder Deadman, startled me and uh, uh, asked me what I was doing. You know, we had a really long heart-to-heart -heart discussion, and uh, finally he agreed to help me leave. I got on a bus. I made it through Calgary all the way south to the U.S. border and uh, made it all the way to Great Falls, Montana. Uh, before finally running into a, a church leader who confronted me in a men's room of the bus station. Because <laughs> they had been sent to intercept you all along the, the route. Exactly, exactly. Um, one reason that, uh, that I was trying to be so careful about leaving is that I knew that Elder Deadman would have to report that I was missing as soon as he found out that I was gone. And then the the mission and the church would send out this APB all around the area for missionaries and local church leaders to go stake out the bus stations and try to catch me. So when this guy confronted me, I pretty much caved in a few minutes. He wanted me to get back on a bus and go back to Calgary and get released from my mission the quote-unquote right way. And I, I kind of fell for that, and so I got back on a bus and went back to Calgary. And then everybody was happy, and, and I was welcomed back into the fold like the prodigal son. And, uh, and that, kind of, that kind of sealed my fate for, for what was going to happen next. Right, because then um, you took a lesson away from this, right? Yeah, that's going to have uh, profound consequences for what happens next. But, but what, what was the lesson that you took away from this whole experience? Well, when, uh, when I came to President Tuttle, which is what I call uh, my mission president in the book, he said, Elder Shun, your companion is the one who's, who's getting in trouble for you running away uh, because he did not do everything in his power as your companion to keep you from leaving. So that's the lesson that I took away, that when a, a missionary is going to try to make a, a decision for himself and leave the mission field, it's my responsibility to stop him. <laughs> right. Well, which, which brings us to the, uh, the title of this book, The, the Accidental <laughs> Terrorist. Yes. Um, tell us how, how, how the... Why is this book called The Accidental Terrorist? Well, it, a couple of months went by. Uh, I was stationed in Calgary. I was given a new companion, and I was actually having a really a pretty good time as a missionary. I was much happier than I had been before. We were working, but we were also having fun. I had friends around. So there was always something to do, always things going on, and always uh, there were new missionaries that you could, we called it going on splits, when you would trade companions with somebody for a day and help them uh, get their uh, door knocking numbers up in their area because we had to report a lot of statistics every week. So I was paired 
uh, for one day with an elder that I call Elder Finn in the book. And unbeknownst to me, he was pretty miserable also, and he'd been planning to leave his mission for quite a while. And he had heard about me trying to run away from my mission, and he figured that on a day when he and I were on splits together, he could talk me into helping him take all his stuff to the airport so he could fly home. He didn't count on the fact that I'd, I'd been pretty much indoctrinated with this idea that I had to do everything in my power to, to stop him. Uh, I rode with him in the car to the airport, and I kept trying every argument I could to get him to stay, and none of them worked. So we get to the airport, and while he's in line to, uh, to check in for his flight... I went off to find a telephone and try to call somebody at the mission office and say, hey, Elder Finn is leaving. I need some help here. I ended up talking to uh, a couple of, uh, of sister missionaries, uh, female missionaries. They tried to contact President Tuttle for me. And when I called them back a few minutes later, they had gotten a hold of him. They said he was on his way to the airport. But in the meantime, I needed to call the airline and ask them to hold Elder Finn's flight so that it didn't leave until President Tuttle could get there and talk to him. And I said, uh, sisters, that is literally a crazy idea. An airline does not change its schedule because someone asks it to. And they said, well, you have to do everything in your power, so you have to try. I was like, all right, whatever. And I hung up the phone, and I'm just thinking... I was I was so confused at this point and so stressed out about what I was going to do about Elder Finn. Uh, I knew there was one thing that I could say if I called the airline that would definitely get them to hold that flight. It, it was just a matter of, you know, just doing it. So, with nothing to lose, really, uh, I looked in the yellow pages i found the number of uh I, I found a number for the airline i called them up someone answered the phone and i said there's a bomb in a suitcase on flight 789 and then i hung up <laughs> and and immediately i realized i had just done something colossally stupid i went walking around the airport and i could see I could see men walking in all directions, talking to little walkie-talkies, um, trying to not draw attention to themselves. But I, I knew what was going on right then. And I, I felt highly visible, um, very guilty. I went to another payphone, and I called the sister missionaries back. And they told me to do the second stupid thing of the day, <laughs> which was to go to the customs gate and somehow get the customs people to let President Tuttle through to talk to Elder Finn before the flight left, and this was just one mistake after another. So I went to the customs people. They immediately became suspicious, and why wouldn't they? Because here's a young Mormon missionary spouting some nonsense about some other missionary who's running away, while meanwhile they know there's been a bomb threat at the airport. Um, and so they got the police involved, and I ended up talking to the police and they let me know that they were pretty certain I had some information for them that would help them solve a case they were working on. Uh, and it would go better for me if I told them everything I knew. So I eventually confessed and was immediately arrested for public mischief and uh, got booked into the big city jail downtown that night, <laughs> and uh, which is where I spent my night. Right, and and so then you, then you find out that your charge is being upgraded from public mischief to hijacking. Exactly, that was a shocking moment. I got out on bail the next day, and then in Canada you have to decide whether you're going to be for for uh, some charges you get the right to decide whether your uh, trial will be by jury or by judge. Um, we chose to go before a judge, uh, and it turned out as the lawyer showed me the statute, that the Crown Prosecutor's Office um, was going to attempt to have my charge raised from public mischief to hijacking. This is because at the moment that I made the phone call, the plane was in the air um, between Edmonton and Calgary. It was 
just going to stop briefly in Calgary to pick up passengers before continuing to Salt Lake. And if you kind of squint at this law, you can construe any threat made against an airplane in the air as hijacking. So that's what the Crown Prosecutor's Office was trying to do. And they were probably trying to do this because the year was 1987, and the Winter Olympics were going to be in Calgary the next year. And what I heard was that the Crown Prosecutor's Office wanted to send a strong signal that Alberta is not soft on terrorism. So I was kind of <laughs> going to be the test case for this idea that, that damn it, Alberta is going to come down hard on any terrorism. Um, I had a pretty good lawyer, though. He was a local member of the church, and we decided to, to try for a plea bargain with the Crown Prosecutor's Office that um, I would plead guilty to public mischief if they uh, would not charge me with hijacking, and then we would go straight into a sentencing phase. So I did that. Um, the Crown Prosecutor's Office was still asking for, you know, something like a two-month jail sentence, whereas my lawyer was asking that because I was a, a good young man who'd been trying to do a good thing, uh, I should just get off with a fine. Eventually, I got just one day in jail uh, and a $2,000 fine. And, uh, and aren't you banned from Canada as well? <laughs> yeah, that was, the, that was the next big consequence. Um, once I was convicted of public mischief, which is a felony, then my case was referred to, um, to Canada Immigration for them to have an inquiry which they did, and they found that I was going to have, I, I was no longer eligible to stay in the country. So rather than deporting me, they gave me what's called a departure notice, which is basically a polite deportation where Canada comes to you and says, we would really appreciate it if you left the country by, say, March 12th. Okay, can you do that? Thank you. And then never come back. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you mentioned that you had a good lawyer, and it seems like there were Mormons pulling strings for you all over the place in this case. Uh, it kind of did. I mean, my lawyer was one of the local church leaders there in, in Canada. Um, and also what I heard, and this is still just anecdotal knowledge as far as I know, but one of my church leaders back home was, uh, pretty high up in the, uh, he he was a an airline pilot and he was pretty high up in the fleet for uh western airlines which was the airline that i that i had actually threatened um and the way it was told to me um uh, western airlines had lost about $20,000 uh on the whole bomb incident the refueling and so forth, but they lost a zero somewhere when they reported this to the authorities. Um, and the judge actually used that figure, $2,000, to set my fine. So uh, I, I apparently got some help from the church leaders back home also. And then between the time when I got out of jail and when I had to leave Canada, there were some local members of the church right there in Calgary who decided they wanted to take up a collection and help pay my fine. Now, um, one of them approached me and asked if they could actually do that, and I kind of freaked out. I was like, the judge specifically said that all the money for this fine has to come from my own savings. He specifically said that, and I was afraid that if anyone tried to help me pay the fine, somehow I'd, I'd end up going back to jail or something. Um, but my companion, my new companion at the time, Elder Snow, who was really a smooth operator kind of stepped in and helped me. And he said, now what Elder Shun means to say is that he could get in trouble for accepting uh, your generous donation, but you might consider instead contributing uh, a little bit of money to his family to put in his mission fund later. Um, so, so essentially I paid the fine and then these folks in Calgary took up a collection and, contributed to my mission fund, and they ended up giving me more money than I'd actually paid in the fine. So I, I made a very small profit of about $150 Canadian on, on this whole adventure. All right, but kids, don't, uh, don't take any lessons from that. No no, 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 no. Terrorism is bad. Absolutely. All right, and 
Oh, and so um, so why don't you give us like uh, af- after that, why don't you give us a quick summary of how you got from <laughs> getting kicked out of Canada as a missionary to where you are now? Well, after I was kicked out of Canada, I finished my mission. I still had another year and a half to go. Uh, and I really thought that I was going to get sent home from my mission after, you know, committing a felony and all that. But no, the church decided to punish me by keeping me as a missionary. So they sent me to the United States, the Spokane mission. Um, I did another 18 months there. I went home. Katrina and I tried to make things work. It didn't really work. And over the next several years, I just slowly drifted away from the church. It wasn't that I was really evaluating the doctrines. Um, It's just that I was not happy going to church. Um, I wasn't happy trying to live this really strict lifestyle. Um, And I was focused more and more on becoming a writer. You know, I I finished college, I got my first jobs, and I started selling uh, short stories. Uh, I sold my first short story to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in 1993. Um, actually to one of my Clarion classmates, uh, Chris Rush, Christine Catherine Rush, who had become editor of FNSF by then. Um, so I started selling a few stories every year, and s- then I had an opportunity to move to New York. And as soon as I was in New York, all this angst that I'd had about uh, feeling that I was living a sinful life and that one day I needed to repent and I would go back to the church and fully embrace it and live a good life again, suddenly all that just just fell away. It was as if living outside of Utah for the first time, except for during my mission, um, suddenly I was, I was no longer bathed in whatever amniotic fluid was, was keeping me um, thinking about Mormonism all the time. And that's when I started uh, studying Mormon history. And that's when I really started uh, learning what had gone on with Joseph Smith uh, that had never been taught in any of, in any of my Sunday school lessons. Uh, I learned that Joseph Smith was um, something of a con man in his youth and had been hauled into court several times and i was really i was really stunned and shocked at all the things i learned i found out that uh that he had been a polygamist also uh it was no surprise that the mormon church had practiced polygamy at some point but the church had never acknowledged uh that joseph smith himself was a polygamist and had something on the order of 40 wives um and in fact the church didn't admit that and, until sometime last year i believe um once I started learning all these things, I, I became very passionate about studying Mormon history, and I, I created a website to talk about everything I'd learned. Uh, and for about 10 years, I was one of, one of the go-to guys online for talking about uh, ex-Mormon issues. Uh, I, I had one of, the, one of the first websites, and I wrote up uh, the earliest version of this story, of my mission story. It was about 50,000 words. It was called Terror on Flight 789. And I got so many letters about that. So many people thought it was it was just hilarious and, wow, what a stupid kid I was. And um, But eventually, after, after 10 years or so, I really, I was, I was tired of, of, uh, of dwelling on Mormonism all the time. It was something I wanted mostly to be in my past, except I still had... Uh, the really burning desire to turn that story, the story of my mission, into a book. Um, and so finally, over... Uh, <laughs> now it's been almost 30 years since these events happened, and finally I've been through uh, probably 10 or 12 drafts of the book, and uh, I'm just very happy and grateful at this point that it, that it's just about out, uh, because it's been a long, long project. Right. So, so how much of the the sort of the length of this project had to do with you continually rewriting the book, and how much of it had to do with difficulty finding a publisher for it? Um, it was primarily difficulty finding a publisher for it. Um, things were looking pretty good back in two thousand one. I mean, the first draft of my book was just massive. It was way too long, but nonetheless, there were a few editors that were interested in it. 
uh, of course, contingent on me doing some significant rewriting. But then 9-11 came along and suddenly um, nobody wanted a book that had terrorist in the title. No one wanted to kind of make a hero out of a terrorist. And, you know, I couldn't really blame them. So that project kind of went on the back burner for a few years. Um, and I was working on science fiction projects. Still publishing stories pretty steadily. Uh, and then a few years later, I got another agent. I did another draft of the book. And somehow that agent decided to quit and become a comedian. <laughs> Um, so I was I was kind of at loose ends again. I had done some really good work on on the book, and I thought it was starting to get towards a publishable state. And uh, I was having trouble finding an agent, so I decided to do a podcast uh, and serialize the the text of the book. Uh, and that went pretty well. I got I I ended up having uh, uh, thousands of listeners for the podcast, and I actually reran the book as a serial a few years later again and uh, and the response was really really good but still I didn't manage to um to find a publisher so every once in a while I would pull the book out and polish it up uh rewrite it somewhat and uh still nothing was happening and somehow I think over all those years I had kind of written the heart out of the book and I was kind of lost and I didn't really know what to do with it um, finally, after more agents had quit and gotten other jobs, <laughs> uh, the agent I'm with now, Barry Goldblatt, who's fantastic, uh, we tried to sell the book a couple of places. It wasn't working. So he sat me down and said, look, I think that what you need to do for this book is self-publish it. You have an audience. You know that from the podcast. Um, and we both know that, that it's a good book. So find an editor you know, polish it up a couple more times and let's get it out there. And, and then you, you will have the headspace to work on other projects. So um, I called up my friend Juliet Ullman, who was an editor at Bantam for, I think, 11 years and was and now is a freelance editor. Uh, and she agreed to take on the project. Uh, we did two drafts of the book together, and she really, really helped me um, focus on what was working in the book helped me get rid of what wasn't and asked me a lot of really probing questions about my uh, my state of mind, my motivations, my expectations. When I was a teenager, um, really helped me get back into the mindset uh, of the teenage boy that I was. Yeah. And so the book in its current form, it kind of parallels your story with the story of Joseph Smith. Why did you decide to structure the book that way? And was it always like that? Or did that occur to you at a at some point in this process? Well, that was that was partially the idea when I started the first draft. And I knew there was going to have to be some Mormon history in the book to make missionary work make sense. Uh, you're going to need to have some kind of grounding in the history, some kind of grounding in the doctrine of the church, or else, you know, all the crazy things we do, it just, it, there would be no context for it. So, I did write four or five chapters in the first draft of the book about Joseph Smith's life, um, about his legacy. And those chapters stayed in through several drafts. But at some point, someone, an agent or an editor or someone, suggested that, that the, the history could go. I needed to, to pare down the book and shorten it and just get rid of the history. So I did that. And I think that's one of the things that kind of took some of the life out of the book although I, I didn't realize it yet at the time. Then when I started working with Juliet Ullman, and she gave me my first set of editorial notes, she said, uh, look, I think there's something missing from this manuscript. Um, I think you, you can either strip the story down and make it an even tighter, um, just fast little story about a missionary on an adventure, or you can open it up. She said, this is what I call the John Krakauer option, and I really hope you'll consider it in the way that Krakauer really delves into the history behind the things he's writing about and uses that to illuminate the story that he's telling. Uh, she said, I really think you have an opportunity here to do that, and you might want to consider um, threading Mormon history through your book so that we can get more of a sense of what this means to missionaries. And I said, oh my 
God, Juliet. <laughs> You are. Did you read an earlier draft of this than what I sent you? Because that's kind of what the book used to be. Uh, she had somehow identified that hole in the manuscript and knew exactly what needed to go in there. And I ended up writing actually about three times uh, more new Mormon history material for the final draft of the book than was even in the first draft. Right. And the sections on Joseph Smith, it's just like... You're just like, how could anyone get away with this stuff? You know, I mean, like, for example, when he he sort of secretly starts marrying multiple wives. And when his first wife finds out about this, she's very, very unhappy. And he says, well, he's getting a revelation from God that you, Emma, need to shut up about this. <laughs> exactly. That was basically Joseph's go to move. Anytime someone was giving him grief and he wanted to shut them up, he was he would basically come back with a revelation that says you need to get in line but it was even it was even harsher when he did it to his own wife uh and one of the crazy things about joseph smith is that when he started into polygamy and started marrying multiple wives uh he he asked women who were already married to his lieutenants to marry him and some of them did uh, so these women ended up having more than one husband at the same time, which is something that Mormons really don't think about today. He married uh, sisters in a lot of cases. In fact, he married two of my great, 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 great aunts who were teenage sisters at the time. Um, their names were Emily and Eliza Partridge. And then a few months later, when he broke the news to Emma that this polygamy thing was going to happen and she had to, to get on board with it, one of the ways he tried to, to make her more happy about it, not happy, but more happy, uh, was to give her the right to pick who his new wives were going to be. So Emma actually picked Emily and Eliza to be Joseph's next new polygamous wives, not knowing that he was already married to them. And so Joseph staged a second wedding ceremony to both girls so that Emma would never find out the truth. <laughs> And then, then the other thing that just like stands out in my mind is just so brazen is that he, I'd never even heard about this before, but that he, he thought that the Bible just wasn't up to snuff. And exactly. so he decided to do his own, he started his own uh, revision of it, uh, right. that he called his translation. Uh, right. And just kind of went through the English version of the Bible because he didn't, I don't think, spoke any ancient languages and just rewrote it, you know, however he thought it could be improved. Exactly, exactly. He did later in his life study uh, Hebrew. Uh, I don't think he ever studied any Greek, so he, he wouldn't have been reading the original manuscripts of the of the Bible by any stretch. Uh, um, but uh, but yeah, he, for instance, decided that he didn't like the scripture where uh, uh, there are two angels in Lot's house and the men in Sodom want want Lot to send the angels out so that they can have their way with them. And Lot says, here, I have two daughters, take them instead. Uh, Joseph didn't like that idea. So he, he changed that scripture to say, I have two daughters here, don't take them. <laughs> and that was basically his approach to rewriting the Bible. He actually also invented a whole, um, a whole book of Enoch, essentially. And this is not quite the same as the Book of Enoch that exists in uh, apocryphal uh, literature. But uh, he took one verse from the Old Testament, or, or a few verses that talk about the prophet Enoch, and wrote a whole story about Enoch, where uh, Enoch's city was so righteous that God took it straight up into heaven. And one day, these uh, when Jesus has returned, and it's the second coming and the millennium, uh, the city of Enoch is going to return to the earth, and it's going to land in Zion, in America, uh, in Jackson County, Missouri, actually, because that's specifically where he identified uh, Zion as uh, as being. Uh, then the city of Enoch would come back, and we would all become friends, and, and everybody would kumbaya and whatever. <laughs> Well, then, then sorry, another example is that he he rewrote the Old Testament to include a prophecy about the coming of Joseph Smith, the great prophet. Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. He could not resist writing himself into his new translation of the Bible um, in that uh, he 
gave, I believe it was uh, the prophet Joseph from the Bible, uh, a prophecy saying that a great prophet would come one day whose name would be the same as his and whose father's name would be the same as his. Um, and that would, that person would do a great work and a wonder um, for, for the world. And then Joseph Smith could point to this verse that he himself inserted into the Bible and say, see, I was prophesied about by Joseph in Egypt. And now here I am. And I have restored uh, the lost gospel to the earth. And, uh, you know, follow me off to Missouri and um, give me all your wives and your money. <laughs> I Because mean, it just seems like I think most people would have the sense that no one could possibly get a- away with all this stuff. Um, but he somehow did. Do you have any perspective on, on how someone could get away with these such like brazen um, manipulations of scripture and all this kind of stuff? Well, I think the brazenness is part of it. I think that Joseph was just so over the top in everything he said uh, that once you bought into it a little bit, you had to go with it all the way because who would really bother making up such incredible, incredible um, stories? Uh, I think that when Joseph started out, uh, probably when he was writing the Book of Mormon, uh, he was conscious about uh, making things up And the fact that he was trying to invent a story that would enrich himself and his family. Um, I think somewhere along the way, once once that first story, uh, the story that he had dug up gold plates and translated the Book of Mormon, once that started getting some traction and people started following him, he turned it into a church. And I think he himself got caught up in the madness and it only emboldened him more. I mean, once you've had a few followers telling you how amazing you are and believing that you're really a prophet of of God, I don't see how that couldn't affect you and spur you on to to create even even bigger and wilder stories. Um, And the amazing thing is that his stories, um, this grand cosmology that he created, which really is, in a lot of ways, it's pretty cool. I think the the thing that was a big attraction to a lot of people is that um, it sort of flattered them with the idea that they were they were the chosen people. They were the first people to have the true gospel of Christ in almost 2,000 years um, because Joseph taught that, that there had been uh, an apostasy for this long and that they were going to be able to go on in the next life and become gods themselves. I mean, this was sort of... Uh, a religion that was that was made for America, the land of manifest destiny. You know, we Americans had this idea that there was endless frontiers and we could keep pushing out into the frontier and we would make our fortune. And that's pretty much the same thing that Joseph was selling, except in a spiritual sense. Hmm. I mean, you know, that makes me think of the other American science fiction religion, Scientology. Do you see Mormonism in like how would you compare and contrast Mormonism with Scientology? Um I think that both institutions I think I think Scientology maybe has been more cynical about it over the years. I think uh I think there's some sincerity to Mormonism and even the Mormon leadership that that I wonder if is present in Scientology. But the thing that I do see in common between them is these very charismatic leaders who just made up incredible stories um, and and people flocked to them. Um, we look at it from the outside. I mean, I look at it having been on the inside of, of Mormonism, but even I look at Joseph Smith's stories um, and I'm amazed that anyone buys into them. Um, but obviously they do, and a lot of people find a lot of comfort in having somebody tell them that they're special and that I have the way to truth that's going to make your life better. Uh, and, and once people get sucked into that, I think they will, they will uh, listen to an amazing amount of, of deceptive material without really processing it critically. And in fact... When I was growing up in the church, my critical faculties were very often 
bent towards not trying to disprove Mormonism, but trying to make it make sense in my head. I spent so much time, and even my friends and I spent time talking about Mormon doctrine and trying to figure out the ins and outs and, and why this scripture says this thing. And we were we were doing a lot of the work of constructing the um, the logical edifice of Mormonism for ourselves. Um, so I, I see the same thing going on with Scientology. Uh, what I see different about Scientology is that it really, it starts in a place that is so far divorced from, from any kind of religious reality that came before it. At least Mormonism sort of started as an outgrowth of, of Christianity. And it was, uh, Joseph Smith used it as kind of, uh, he was reclaiming Christianity. Scientology is just out there on a whole different plane of, of existence. Well, I mean, you know, two statements in your book that you quote from Mormon leaders really jumped out at me. And one is you have a guy saying, you know, some things that are true are not useful. Um, and also uh, at one point, I guess it was Tuttle, he, he says, Satan loves to play to the vanity of the intellect. He can use it to convince you to listen to your head over your heart. And it just seems like maybe that helps explain how people are able to buy into this, this, this sort of message of like, oh, the, you know, what's true isn't so important. What you think in your head isn't so important. It's the, your heart and your faith are, are the important things to focus on. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many times growing up I was told that, um, that being smart uh, was going to be as much of a hindrance to me in, in the church as, as, uh, as a help. Um, and it, it really made me, you know, turn my own, my own thought processes against myself, uh, in, in, in a way. And yeah, I think, I think once you, once you stop, uh, regarding logic as something that can tell you the truth and, and you've begun to believe that it only comes through feelings, then you're really susceptible to almost anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned earlier that there are a lot of science fiction authors who are Mormons these days. I'm just curious, like, do you interact with them at all? Have you had conversations with any of them about any of this stuff? Uh, we've talked about it uh, back in the day. When I lived in Utah still, and this is, this is going back over 20 years, uh, I was part of, of a, a big writing group in Utah County called uh, Zenobia. And we met every, every week. Um, and people like, uh, David Farland were in the group, um, this, and, and the group had sort of been started around, uh, a class at BYU that was supposed to have been taught by Orson Scott Card, but wasn't, but everybody who was in the class, uh, together decided to form this writing group and they started a, a literary magazine, a science fiction magazine at BYU called The Leading Edge, um, and Science fiction has really spread there, um, I think, over the past 25 years. It's just grown and grown, and uh, to the point that there's a, an annual science fiction convention at Brigham Young University called Life, the Universe, and Everything. Uh, it's really, really big around there. And I think, again, Orson Scott Card, uh, love him or hate him, and, you know, I, I don't really love him anymore. <laughs> um, he he really did jumpstart this whole thing and uh, and make science fiction safe for Mormons and and Mormons have really flocked to it. I don't interact so much with uh, with writers who are still part of the religion these days, but I, I certainly see their work around a lot. You mentioned I mean you mentioned in the book that Orson Scott Card had been an idol of yours when you were younger. And I, yeah, I, I would imagine you have complicated feelings about him now. But I, I saw a thing on, you had a post on your blog about how you thought Ender's Game was influenced by Mormon theology. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, John Kessel had written an essay that was very critical of Ender's Game, and uh, this whole idea that Ender is a hero who only does bad things when bad people force him to do force him to do bad things. Um, he is entirely blameless in anything that he does. And this was, this essay was kind of an eye opener for me because I had read Ender's Game four or five times and I just loved it. And John Kessel made me see it in a completely different way. And that also made me see 
that uh, that this was kind of a theme in Mormonism. The f- first narrator of the Book of Mormon is a character named Nephi, who, very much like Ender, is is kind of innocent, and he only does bad things when when bad people do bad things to him. Um, he's supposed to get a set of uh, of scriptural records from a guy named Laban before going off to uh to America to found a new a new nation um and he tries several times to talk Laban into giving him these records and Laban tries to kill him and so forth finally Nephi makes one last attempt to get these records he sneaks into Laban's house and finds that Laban is drunk and passed out and God tells him at that point hey Laban's here. I've delivered him into your hands. Take this sword and cut his head off. And Nephi says, wait, I don't, I don't cut people's heads off. And God says, well, you know, you got to do it because you need to get those records. And so Nephi does it and he still retains his, uh, his innocence somehow because, because it was God who told him to, to commit this, this act of murder. And I, I read that passage now in the Book of Mormon, and I think, well, the guy's passed out. Why don't you just go steal the records yes. while he's passed out and leave? You don't need to kill anybody. Um, but somehow there's, there's this need to, um, to be overly violent in Nephi's character in the Book of Mormon. And I see that in Ender also. And uh, I think the the last chapter of the uh, of Ender's game is very obviously um, an analogy for the Bible and the Book of Mormon. There are two books that are talked about in in the last chapter of Ender's game, um, and I forget the names of the books. I think one of them is called the. Uh, never mind about that. Uh, I want to say like it's like the Hive Queen and the Hegemon or something like that. Yes, yes, exactly. The Hive Queen and the Hegemon. Um, and then there's a, another book whose name I, I can't remember. But some people think that they're written by the same author and other people are sure that they're not. Uh, so I see that as a very clear analogy for the Bible and the Book of Mormon and how everyone takes, well, everyone, all Christians take the Bible as the word of God. But not all of them believe that the Book of Mormon is the is the Word of God, and he only developed those themes further in the uh, in his uh, Earth series and in the Alvin Maker series, which is completely based on the life of Joseph Smith. Uh-huh. What, I mean, what do you make of those those two? The, isn't the like, is the Homecoming series in the Alvin Maker series? Home- Right, the Homecoming series. Uh, I didn't read the whole Homecoming series. I, I enjoyed the first few books. Uh, and I I really liked the Alvin Maker books, especially Red Prophet. But with both of those series and with the Ender's books, I think the the quality went uh, downhill faster and faster the farther he got into the series. I think he starts out very strong, uh, and then sort of falters in the in the end. Hmm. Do you know uh, Bill? Do you know the author Brian Evanson? Uh, I do, I do. I haven't read much of his stuff. I've met him a couple of times. Uh, I I know that he was excommunicated for actually, basically, for his writing, his fiction. Yeah, I mean, my understanding is he was a, a, a writing professor at uh, BYU, and they basically told him stop writing horror or you're out of here. And he chose to keep writing horror and <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> yeah, and my my understanding, I, I'm. I'm pretty sure he was a bishop also, or a branch president in the Mormon church as well. Uh, and he didn't kowtow to them and suffered the consequences. He doesn't seem too broken up about having been excommunicated from the little I've talked to him. But I'm, I'm sure that that had uh, difficult consequences for him in his personal life. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're pretty much out of time. Uh, Bill, do you just want to mention any other projects or what other writing kind of things do you have going on? Well, earlier this year, I published a, a story on an online magazine called Across the Margin. Uh, the story is called Our Dependency on Foreign Keys. Uh, I have a new short story that just came out in an online literary magazine called Bloodstone Review. Uh, that story is called after the earthquake, a fire. And it's actually a fictionalized account of some things that 
that uh, happened to me as a missionary after the events uh, from the accidental terrorist. So that might be of interest to people who, who've read the memoir. And other than that, I've, I'm very eager to get back to work on a couple of science fiction novels that have been on hold for a couple of years now while I worked on the, on the memoir. All right, well, that all sounds great. I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with William Shun. And again, this new book is called The Accidental Terrorist. I highly recommend it. It's, it's very, very entertaining. So, Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. It was a, a great pleasure. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to William Shun for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who's given us five stars on iTunes, including Tricky Chicken and Wyoming Boy in the U.S. and Games Freezer in the U.K. Games Freezer calls the show the only podcast you will ever need. And Wyoming Boy writes, The answer to life, the universe, and everything. I don't remember how I came across Geek's Guide, but I'm glad I did. I live in the desolate and rural state of Wyoming and have an hour drive one way to work. David and his guest geeks make the drive go much quicker than if I were listening to local radio, and some of the conversations help spark writing ideas. This is a wonderful podcast, and every episode has something to offer. I have been suggesting it to all my science-minded and geek friends. So big thanks again to Wyoming Boy, Tricky Chicken, and Games Freezer for the great reviews. And of course, a special thank you to Keith Bergun and Daniel Estevez, who both signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd prefer to make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today's show, The Great Courses. Remember that if you do decide to purchase one of their classes, you should head on over to thegreatcourses.com slash galaxy. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.